Well, here we are today back with Smoothies with Rufus, my tag team partner, Corey Hecht. And today our special guest is Drake Berberet. Did I say that right? I've been yeah. practicing. Yeah, yeah it's okay. uh, Berberet, so it has a T on it, but okay. it's a, it has a French okay. ending. Okay. And Drake is with uh, Hawk and Dynamics. And sure. I, uh, Hawk and Dynamics force plates, actually. And... Um, uh, and I started getting interested in force plates. And I started calling around and Drake's the only one that would return my call. <laughs> oh, so, but he's, he's been incredibly helpful to me. Teach me about force plates and all the things you can do in it and everything. And so we want to have a little discussion on, you know, a little bit about what a force plate, you know, does and is and different things, what it measures all these different things and um uh hopefully if we can get into it um um you know maybe we, we can see some live examples or something and and uh drake maybe get back there and actually jump for us maybe but if i get yeah, him up definitely <laughs> pretty comfortable in the share right now but no <laughs> so, no so, uh, the, the first time we talked uh that was actually that was the longest demo I've ever done at Hawk and Dynamics in almost four years. I think we were on that call for like two and a half hours. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> we were just chopping it up and going through stuff. Oh, it, it was awesome, Corey. I wish you could have been on it. It was so cool. And then at the end, I told him, I said, "Well, go ahead with your uh, with your sales pitch." He's already gave it. <laughs> <laughs> then we went much farther. So, um, so. Give us a little background on, 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 give us a little bit of your background a little bit. I know you've been a strength coach and, and different things, which I always appreciate. And, um, uh, and then, uh, kind of go into, you know, a little bit about what a force plate is and stuff. And I know Corey's got a, got a load of questions like he always does. And, and we'll just fire questions at you. I know you have to leave. So make sure you tell us when you got to go. Okay. And we can right. pick it up again sometime or do something else. Okay. Cool. So go ahead. Um, yeah, so a uh, quick background, uh, kind of get here today. So I actually, so I have degrees in exercise science, human performance. Um, and I actually, I was in a weird, I was in a unique position in undergrad where I could actually start my master's when I was still in undergrad. So I kind of, I finished my undergrad, quote unquote, in three years, started my master's was done with my master's in four and a half I say that just because it let it let me like get a get out in the field quicker um because when I was actually doing my master's it was like you know finished out my fourth year had half my master's done um had the opportunity to go immediately into the field so um, I actually went and took a professional internship at UIS uh, which stands for University of Illinois Springfield so satellite location uh division two school and there was only one head strength coach here at the time. So I had previous experience in the private sector. Um, I, at that point, I'd really been in the summer working with, you know, decent level athletes, college athletes since I was like 17. So I had some training experience, program experience. So when I got to UIS, he actually kind of just threw me into the fire, um, gave me some teams, gave me a lot of autonomy early. Um, and it, it was a lot at that point, but really looking back on it, it, provided a lot of context for like how college sports operate, um, especially in like an Olympic environment. Um, from that experience, I actually got in contact with Max Schmarzo, uh, Strong by Science on Instagram is his handle. Uh, but he was at a place called Resilience Code Out in Inglewood, Colorado, just south of Denver. Um, some of you guys might know that location because they they work with land out performance a little bit or used to like we would we would train like their MMA fighters do some of their sports science stuff um, for them because those facilities are really close out there. Um, so I went out there for a long summer uh, worked for Max learned an incredible amount from him because he's a he's like an encycl encyclopedia of information um, but kind of learned the sports science process because out there that facility uh, anything money could buy you, we had access to like force plates, um, IMUs, all the VBTs, force velocity, profiling treadmills, gate treadmills, blood biomarkers on every single person we worked with. We had physical therapy there, athletic trainers, uh, neurofeedback. We had neurosurgeons, 
functional medicine clinic, like literally anything, chiropractors, massage therapists, the whole game and under one roof. So that yeah. was one of the, yeah, was, yeah, that was one of the best experiences that like I had this experience early. So like it kind of set the stage of like at that point I didn't know if this is what everything looks like or you know, <laughs> yeah, I love this. This is the best field ever. I'm just gonna go somewhere else and have this myself. I, I learned quickly that that place was super unique. Um, worked with we we had a lot of high level athletes out there, um, business executive people that would fly in for a weekend, and we would we would do the performance side, but we also you know got the other side of their health, paired it together, gave them a high level service. So, you know, learned so much that summer. Um, took that information back. Was going to finish my master's at the school that I had started at St Ambrose um, in the Quad Cities in Iowa, and they were going to let me teach courses at this point while I was finishing only really had like a, a semester, two semesters left. As soon as I got back there, like two days later, text my mom, I hate this. Like I was around athletes for so long. I got back. It was great to be teaching and around kids and in that environment, that new challenge, but it was just missing like that interaction on a daily basis. Um, she convinced me to stick it out. So stuck it out, but was looking for opportunities throughout that, that whole semester. Um, actually had a few one I was gonna I was gonna go to Western Illinois and, and be with baseball there uh, the guy that was ahead of that department actually went to Temple football and this was right this was like a couple of weeks before the semester ended um, so I was kind of left you know back to you know level one didn't really have a place to go was wanting to get out um, so I found a connection uh, with Adam Fletcher at Illinois basketball uh, it was about three and a half hours away, uh, distance wise at this point. Um, but basically messaged him and uh, got him to respond. And he said, uh, you know, sure, come to shoot around. We'll talk, you know, you can come watch a game and see what happens. So there really wasn't a position. And Adam Fletcher's with Illinois basketball. Um, so I think it was like a week later that Saturday, drove to Champaign, Illinois, uh, sat down and shoot around. Watched the shoot around, uh, went with Fletcher in the locker room, uh, chatted about, you know, background at resilience code background at this point. Um, he had he had just purchased Hawken force plates at that point. So at this time, Hawken was super new. Like there was only a handful of users that were even in the world. So Fletcher was one of them. He had a mountain of data. Um, he just started collecting because it was quick to use, but wasn't wasn't applying it entirely. It was kind of just a collection period. Um, I had that background, so sat down with him, explained it. You know, he initially said there's no no opportunities here, and we sat down for an hour, and and there was an opportunity there. So, I actually joined Illinois basketball uh, staff that winter. Um, I spent two seasons there. Uh, great experience. Uh, two in entirely different seasons. The first season, I think we won like eight games. Um, different caliber of athletes. Second year, we won like. 24 or something like that won a lot of games a lot of fun traveling different athletes um and then i left after that second season um actually came out here and joined hawking dynamics full time um and then i've been here uh two years just last month so it's been good experience i i get to travel travel around the country a lot now and meet strength conditioning coaches physical therapists athletic trainers um, and also speak to people like you guys all the time on the phone. Awesome. Awesome. Um, I'm sure that bump and pay when you went from eight wins to 24 wins was pretty enormous too, wasn't it? Because it I'm, was, sure that, uh, I'm sure that was all you, right? And your data. Um, uh, uh, no, I, that, that's cool. So um, um, tell, tell us a little bit about um, – uh, you know what what the fourth place is i love i love the bathroom scale analogy mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, and you know kind of how they work and we can get into some questions and different things cool so uh force plates they're not it's not necessarily new technology um the app like the application that we're applying it in is fairly new probably within the last 10 years um, we're about five year old company um, but the application in this performance sector is fairly new. Um, the plates hardware itself has been around for almost 40 years, 40, 47, I think. Um, AMTI 
down in Boston. Um, they actually came out with like the first commercial grade plate. Um, but these force, pl like force plates in general are used in not just for humans and, perf and performance, like animals walk over force plates. Um, you know, there's studies on insects and, you know, different variations of plates and a lot of different stuff. Um, we, so we took that technology that existed, we made it wireless. So we were the first wireless uh, force plate manufacturers. And then we were also the first to have the mobile app. So now we took a technology that, you know, it's kind of cumbersome, took a while to set up. You had to have the perfect environment, had to plug it into your computer, you know, had to have MATLAB or biomechanists on the back end processing the data. You had to have some, you know, skills with encoding to be able to get that data usable. Um, so we took all that wireless mobile app. So on your phone or a tablet. And, you know, I think made a software that I think the market was asking for. Like we really built our product to, to uh, suit the coaches and the people that we're, we're selling to. Um, so we're trying to solve like real problems, make the coach's job easier. Um, Cause we know time is a commodity, especially in the, in the college setting and pro setting. So how can we make a product that saves time and streamlines those, those processes for you? Sure. Um, I know the software you showed me and, and different things when we met, even I can understand it, you know, and it's, it's so easy. And uh, I know others, you have to, some of them you have to write your own software or something or, or is that right? You're, is that, am I saying that right? Yeah, there, there's a few commercially, like commercial force plate companies out there now that have software that it'll process it for you. Um, I still think we're, we're the quickest option. Um, but more of like the, you know, when I was, even when I was an undergrad, like we had uh, in-ground force plates, the data would come out and like it took me all night in order to just process like my one jump. You know, I had to sit at my computer for hours and figure out what any of this stuff meant. Where now, like it happens immediately. In front oh, of just spits like, right it spits right out, as I recall, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so that's cool. So um, probably the biggest thing, I think, from and, <coughs> and you guys get on your website, what is it? Hawkandynamics.com, I think. Yeah, that's um, it. Uh, they got all these great articles on there. And so I, I've read all the articles and I was going back through them this morning. Some, some of them anyway. And it seems like the most popular test is a counter movement jump, right? So yeah. um, um, I know, you know everybody in the world uses a counter movement jump, but the only thing we're looking at is the height or the, or the jump height, right? And um, can, can we go a little deeper into what's involved in that jump height uh, and different things, which fascinates me. And, uh, um, and so, cause Corey and I talk about the loading and unloading all the time. We call it loading and unloading and yours mm -hmm. is waiting, wait, waiting or unwaiting and breaking. Right. And, uh, so yeah, let's, let's kind of, let's kind of get in, let's kind of get into that a little bit. And, uh, and I, I mean, we could do hours on the, on just on this, I think. <laughs> yeah. We could probably talk the whole time about this. Um, so the counter movement jump has also, it's been around for a long time. Um, essentially it is just a way to standardize, um, like we talk about phases, you said loading and unloading, uh, there's a push off phase, which is called propulsion. Um, and then that flight phase is when the athlete is in the air. So the counter movement jump, it has all of those phases. So it allows us in a standardized manner to assess an individual's ability to move, um, not only as a whole, but through each one of those phases. Um, and then we have, you know, we can measure time on the plates, how long it took to produce the jump, how long it took to do uh, each one of those phases, uh, the velocity that you're moving throughout each one of those phases, uh, the force you produced, uh, we can get power and also displacement. So displacement is just how far they traveled. So we give a metric counter movement depth uh, or counter movement displacement, but it, it is depth. You could think of it as like a range of motion metric. How far down are they sinking in that jump? Um, so that, you know, at a, a step back, that is why the counter movement jump has been used historically in a lot of the research. And that's why we suggest it as a first assessment for almost all of our, our users. Um, but, you know, talking about jump height, like traditionally, we think about the technology that was available. So you had like a, a vertex where you jumped up, hit the beams. Um, you had a wall and, and chalk. You could measure it with a ruler, how high you jumped. You had a jump mat, uh, which is a little better. It did have a time component to it. 
Um, there's things like the G flight, which is a laser, it measures it from flight time. Um, so the technology that existed, people were limited with that. Like they could really just get um, jump height and then time metrics. So now with the force plate, now that these are dropping in price, becoming more available to everyone else, there's a whole you know other array of metrics that are valuable that people just didn't really have access to uh, before now. So we have a system, it's called the ODS system. So O stands for output and you could, that's like your jump height metrics. So that's after the jump's done, that body of work and the unweighting, breaking in propulsion uh, and the athlete leaves the plate, you're gonna get that value at the end of those, those phases. So a lot of your power metrics will fall within here, um, like peak relative propulsive power, uh, peak propulsive power. Um, can't really influence those too much without influencing the parts first. Um, the parts would be D, so that's your driver metrics. So think about like you're lifting up the hood, um, checking out the engine, seeing what this car is made of. Um, we're trying to do the same thing with an athlete. So we want to open the hood of the athlete. Hey, is this athlete more on the braking side? Or are they more on the propulsion side? Do they have an inability to transfer the momentum that they generated in the unloading and loading into propulsion? Can they be more efficient there? Um, and then strategy, you know, these all influence each other, but strategy is how did athlete get from point A when they started to point B when they left the plate? So these metrics are time-based metrics. So, you know, time to take off, which is just jump time. Um, could be braking time, propulsion time. Um, asymmetry metrics, we also put into this category because if you, your strategy changes, you know, day to day, if you're putting more force through your left side than your right side on this day. So that's a different strategy that you're, you know, applying to get the out, output. Um, and then displacement metrics as well. So like that counter movement depth would fall in this category. So in short, that's how we've simplified um, kind of the chaos that exists with a massive number of metrics that are now given um, by, on force plates. Okay, um, can you uh, uh, go in, um, uh, can you go into a little bit about um, um, the, you know, I, I think you told me that you guys feel like the the unweighting and the braking phase are two most important. Can you go on and, and explain those in detail, please? Yeah. Um, so, so first, uh, force plates are kind of, there's different scenarios that you would use plates. The, the most common ones are for monitoring readiness, uh, benchmarking or profiling athletes, and then return to play. Um, so breaking and loading and unloading or unloading and loading uh, that would be synonymous with unweighting and breaking uh, the different terminology we're using here but breaking metrics um, we'll think about it from like a, let's take a step back first so if the goal is to jump high we first have to produce a propulsive net impulse which is just that body of work you can think of it as body work that's being done in the propulsion phase before they actually leave the plate. So it's that point from when they're down at the very bottom of the jump to when they actually leave. So think about chopping that counter movement in half. That's your propulsive phase. The braking is from the point when you're, you could think of it from the point when you're starting to that low position is, is that unloading period. Um, but if you really cut it in half, the unweighting is before that braking and then propulsion from low to off the plate. So in order to jump high, you need that propulsive area to be large um, in order, but that's only, that's after the jump is already, there's two phases before that. So your braking impulse or your area will equal your unweighting. So separate that kind of movement in half, um, unweighting and braking on the left, propulsion and then off the plate on the right. So we have to be able to transfer the momentum that we generated in our unloading and loading into our propulsion in order to produce a big area and jump high. So that's why, I mean, everything matters in the jump from the start. It's not just like, hey, we need more propulsive net impulse. I mean, yeah, that is true. If you're in a correlation, it'd be really high, almost one, one to one. But it starts in the beginning, not just at the end. So that's why I really value unweighting and breaking. And that's a place that I start um, with a lot of athletes. If I just go and look at their strategy and their shape of how they're moving um, in a counter movement jump. Um, do you have an example you can put up 
on the yeah. thing. So we can see it. Just kind of go through. Um, so this is actually a, a presentation that if I present places, I'll usually do this one or some, or some variation of it. Um, but these are the six key phases of the counter movement jump. Um, this is a paper. If people are listening, you can you can just Google that and it'll come right up. Um, our software color codes the phases, so it's a little easier to identify. Um, the first one is it's actually in the gray, not not necessarily one we've talked about, uh, but it's really easy to understand. Um, it's the wane period. It's just that period of time when an athlete is standing still on the plate, um, getting ready for the test to begin. As simple as that may seem, it's super important. A lot of people mess that up because we know, we think about athletes, they love to move around, they get on the plates, shuffle on their feet, you know, maybe they're dancing to the music. We need that weighing period to be as flat as possible in order to accurately collect the rest of the metrics. Because that weighing period is a threshold um, to say, hey, tell our software, hey, this is the unweighting, this is the breaking, this is the propulsion. Um, so if that weighing period is locked in, you can feel really good about the rest of the metrics that are, are calculated on that and, test. And so the um, there, there's a beef that goes along with that, right? Yeah, so we uh, really early on, um, almost from the beginning, so we actually, one of our core values here is like, you know, like data quality is going to be the highest. Like we're going to, we're going to give users the best data possible to collect. So we actually put in uh, this trigger. So you hit play on the tablet and the test will not start until it actually gathers a flat line weighing period and then it'll beep. So you hit start, there's a delay beep and that signals athlete to go. So we're collecting, even though the athlete hasn't started moving, we're gathering that, that quiet period. So it's, it's kind of a, a fail safe um, if athletes aren't moving on the plates, but there is some level on the coach or the person that's actually administering the test to watch the athlete, make sure they're not shifting around a whole lot. So the, the next phase um, after the weighing period would be the unweighting phase. I kind of like to separate this one in half. Um, this is the yellow one if, if you're watching. So, and Max Marza was actually the one that made this really click for me. So you could think of if you drew a line down the middle as the left half being almost a free fall on the plates. So, you know, test beeps, cheers the athlete, time to jump. They kind of just, they're not falling through the air, but they're, they're says their body weight is less than what they are. So they almost fall and then catch themselves at the bottom. It's a quick unweight. They start applying force. Um, they're always applying force because it's not zero, but they start applying more force right there at the bottom of the unweighting. Um, sorry. And then it's, you know, it's a rate, it's a force development from that point all the way to the very top. Um, breaking phase or breaking rate of force development. A lot of people have heard that term. Um, that starts when it gets back to system weight in the red, uh, between the red and the green. So uh, breaking phase, you could think of that as deceleration. Propulsive right after the, the red is in the green. Um, that is from the low position of the jump to moving off and away from the plate into the air. Someone really wants to call. Um, and then takeoff, you see that down there at the bottom, that's when they actually leave the plate. Um, force is zero, flying through the air, and then they touch down, um, and that's the landing phase there on the right side of the screen. So all those phases, and then we have left and right plates, so we give you left and right throughout each one of those phases as well. Can you get into, like, a little bit the difference between unweighting and braking and why there's no, like, rate of force development, quote-unquote, in that breaking in that unweighting phase? In the unweighting. Like, how is that different? So there could be, um, there could be like an unweighting rate of force development and it would probably start like right there where the cursor is at that halfway point. Um, but technically based on this paper, which is, is the standard of how to calculate uh, these different phases, the breaking phase does not begin until it gets back to system weight. So it's that crossover point is when we actually start measuring breaking rate of force development. Um, almost all, if not all of our metrics um, have, they're rooted in, in the literature. So like in order for us to new, add a new metric, it needs to be available within research for us to point to and say, hey, this is you know, a viable metric that 
the consensus, the body of research says that, you know, this makes sense. Um, then we check it with our science team. So we, or our research and science team, and then we build it in. So that's why we don't have an unweighting rate of force development. Um, but in, you know, in theory, there is a rate of force development that occurs there from this point to uh, that point there. And then how come you say that these two are going to be really important in terms of jump height compared to just the propulsive phase where they start yeah. to come back up? So uh, this yellow line on the screen, the one that's running all the way through, um, imagine if we if we drew a line right here at system weight and we, we measured this area of unweighting. So that will equal the area within breaking right here. We did the same thing. So those two would be the same area, same impulse. And then in propulsion, this impulse here will equal, I mean, these two, because you have to build a land with, with the same impulse to stop yourself. Um, but we know that if you have a big area in the green, a big impulse, you'll move your body quicker off the plate and you'll jump higher. So the, seg the segmented portion is when you actually go from braking to propulsion. So an athlete also has to be good at, you know, transferring that momentum from this unweighting braking into propulsion in order to jump high. So that's why it's not only about propulsion and that impulse. Because um, an athlete could have really good propulsion and that impulse comparative to his peers. But he may have zero breaks, and then therefore you might, you know, he's that honestly put it puts an athlete more at risk if their breaking is so bad because that is a deceleration quality. Like you don't really have that ability in a standardized manner. You know, do you have it when you go out and and perform in a more open task like on on field or on court? Have any questions, Rufus? Um, so. <laughs> So I know you explained this to me a thousand times, but so <laughs> this athlete, okay, how would we improve his vertical jump based on the weighting and the braking phases? Yeah, so this jump here is pretty good. Um, yeah, like but what, I mean, how, how would we improve it or, you know, what? Yeah, I mean, so that's the secret sauce right there. Yeah, yeah. That's, where, well, that's, where, that's where coaches make their money, or they yeah, can, yeah. you know, if you can, so, you can measure uh, it and then train it. Uh, so I guess what I'm trying to say is, okay, should, should the initial um, unweighting line be steeper and deeper to improve it? Yeah, so we can get into, like, what would be considered efficient, um, you know, and a good starting point, because – we have to put this into context too. So I would, I would look at this curve and say, that's a good curve, but what does good mean? You know, there's, there's 50, 50 to hundred different types of sports, different positions within each sport. Those bodies are you're going to have different qualities that they've built up just by playing their sport, let alone training on top of it. So each sport and position will have a unique characteristic, a shape characteristic. So some sports, you know, let's say like hockey, they tend to have more breaking qualities than a sport like basketball, where a lot more propulsive. It's an easy example to compare the two. Um, but we'll say, you know, what is efficient? And this is kind of drawn from a couple different papers and then just thinking how the body would move, you know, bioenergetically efficient manner. Um, there's one paper, it's, it's actually Adam Virgil is on the paper, um, and I, I think the lead professor is Declan Conley. Um, he's, he actually since passed, but he, Adam's on it with him. It's on our blog. It's called um, a review of 100 counter movement jumps, which one is optimal. So they were in Vermont, and they took, Vermont's been using our plates for a long time, and they took a, like a massive amount of data, and they basically took like the top 100 jumps. And they looked at um, the performers that jumped the highest, where did they produce their peak force? And peak force happens around the red and the green, this little, this line that separates the two. So we can take that paper and say, all right, if you want to jump high, you would like to have peak force between the red and the green. That would be an efficient way to do it. Um, and it makes sense too. So think about when an athlete, they start their jump, they get to the bottom, if everything's coiled there at the bottom before they push away from the plate and they have peak force happening at that instantaneous second, and then they jump off the plate like a rocket, that would be, you know, that'd be good. Instead of them like get to the bottom, can't produce peak force, and then they're producing peak force somewhere on the way off the plate, probably wouldn't be able to use that elastic energy that they just coiled within the breaking pace to get off that plate more efficiently. So 
Um, we go our peak force between the red and the green. Um, and then we also think we go back to this unweighting. So I like to see this unweighting uh, phase look like a U, um, get down close to zero as possible because that we're really maximizing um, the full unweight to further set up our braking. Um, the problem is, is if you fully maximize this unweighting and when you get to the braking, can't really handle what you just built up. Um, your braking rate of force development is probably going to look more like a, you know, long hill in the Midwest than it will like a mountain, you know, out here on the East Coast. So you want it to be steep braking rate of force development because you want the athlete to get from uh, that unweight to that peak force of the low position as quickly as possible. Um, like the highest and the highest braking rate of force development I've seen on our plates is like it's like a little over twenty thousand, which is extremely high. Like I think I hover like probably around eight thousand. Um, so it was a, a BMX racer, so super <laughs> explosive. Um, but then once you get to that low position, peak force should happen there. And you want them from the low position, you just you really want that to be like a nice hump right over the hump off the plate. Um something that exists in literature and has been talked about for a while is this concept of like bimodal unimodal peaks. Um, unimodal just means it exhibits a shape that is one hump. And then bimodal means that it's two humps. So it's like get to that low position and then it, another hump out on the right side, or it could be, you know, a hump at the top, they get to peak force, but then there's another hump that's lower at the bottom. Um, wouldn't be as efficient, but with context. So like, we think about like uh, basketball players, centers over seven feet tall, close to seven feet tall, you know, 300 pound athletes. They're, they're freaks of nature. First off, they're going to move a lot different than what we would call efficient. Um, a lot of times those athletes will use their torso as like a whip at the bottom from that low position. So you'll actually see what appears to be a, a double a bi or a bimodal peak um, in that propulsive phase, but it's them using their torso as a whip. Now, is that as efficient as it could be? No. Could we train them to not whip their torso and come up as one? <clears throat> yes. But then are, are they a good player? Um, is that really going to influence their the way they move if we affect that quality? Or is there something on the curve that holds more weight? Um, those are all the questions that you have to ask and you know, the coach would, the coach training them should have that context and use the information that we provide with the context that they have as well. So Drake, just to like kind of break this down kind of step by step. So for the, un, the unweighting phase, you're initially lowering to the ground where you're in quote unquote free fall, where you're not putting any force into the ground. Then at a certain point, you're still going to be lowering, but you have to start putting that force into the ground so you don't just completely collapse. And that's, is that when the braking phase starts or is that still during some of the unweighting? So still unweighting. So between the yellow and the red, you see that on the figure there, that's that point right there is when uh, braking rate of force development begins. Gotcha. So thank, uh, <clears throat> and the force is still being applied cause it's not zero. Um, but think of it as like, you know, like a drop catch. Have you ever done like a drop catch exercise? So think of it as like that action, but like a drop catch overemphasizes like free falling and leaving your feet where a lot of times the, like there are, there are athletes that will leave the plates like very briefly on that unweighting. Um, but you want to get to as close as you can as possible quickly now that with that context too. So it's all dependent on the sport and the, the type of athlete that you're trying to improve on. Gotcha. And so it's like during that unweighting, they're going to start to, hit like more of that positive up curve where they're putting more force into the ground, mm -hmm. but they're still dropping down into the jump. Then eventually it's going to mm -hmm. go into braking. And then as they're going to reach a certain point in braking where they stop going down, have to redirect everything to go up and that's going to be propulsive. Correct. Yep. And so like in terms of an efficient jump, we're looking for like, I guess a combination of all three looking good, but generally like when you hit that bottom position, or like go from breaking to propulsive, you want to be able to redirect quickly going right back up. And that's what you're saying with like the peak rate of force development at that point. Am I hitting, getting that right? Uh, peak. So it would be your peak force. Peak force. Um, yeah. So rate of force development is a, it's over a body of time where like peak force is just an instantaneous point in time. 
um, and you would want that to happen as close to the low position as possible, which is between that red and green um, on the figure. And that allows the athlete to immediately hit that bottom and then come right back up quickly without having like things continually like bringing them down, so to speak. Yeah, think of think of an and think of like a uh, an athlete that gets to that low position but can't really redirect that momentum. So they kind of drag out on the bottom and they spend a little longer down there. Um, you would typically see peak force happen um, off in the green like that. You would get like a double peak because there's kind of like a latency. They're dragging out to get to peak force and off the plate. Gotcha. Um, but you, you could have peak force happen within breaking side as well. And so is this kind of why you're saying that the unweighting and the breaking are just as important, if not more important than the propulsive phase? Because if you don't do the things to get you to the bottom to redirect, your propulsive phase is not going to be as good as you start to come up. Yeah. So you, you have to, it all matters. Um, but when you get to propulsion, you have to be able to handle what you just generated. Like that, that's kind of a sim simple form. Um, so if you can generate a lot and unweighting and breaking, and then you can handle when you get there, then you'll probably jump high. That's cool. And then like every athlete or like every sport and within that, like positions are going to have certain signatures that are consistent throughout their just general counter movement jump. Yeah. So I mean, we look, we've looked at a lot of data over like the last four years, like stupid amount of different body types, um, different athletes. And I think the curves, I would say, and it's, I used to say like sport and position will have a body type and I do still say that, but I think it's more like, you know, there's body types that exist among like different sports. So like your guards in basketball, probably going to be more like your wide receivers and DBs in football. Um, and, you know, within soccer, lacrosse, there's going to be positions that are also very similar to guards and basketball. Now, like the skill of your gameplay is a lot different, but like the characteristics that it demands, like um, lots of change of direction, quick, smaller size athletes, lots of cutting. So I'm tending to pair those together. Um, and then, then I would have like a different optimal, um, for those body types and what their, their, their position is asking of them. So when you're doing this testing, you can have someone come in and be like, based on their body type and, or mostly their body type, but also potentially what position they feel like, here's what we would expect to see. Like, here's where you're at and you can kind of, or I guess more on the coach, but to bridge that gap between what you'd expect and what you guys are seeing. Yeah, so it, it's, you know, like if you have someone that really knows the ins and outs of play, it's like I can I could jump an athlete, see the curve, and like be able to make an assumption very quickly. Now, like people that are new to force splits, um, I would suggest using metrics first. So like build a database. Um, you, you have groups of different positions. You gather norms of like, hey, you know, all of my guards have a breaking down impulse of this. Great. We just collected six months of data. So now I bring a new athlete in. He's a guard. He just joined the team. So I want to jump him and say, all right, what's his breaking in impulse? I have six months worth of data on my guards. Where is he at? Let's say it's way down, right? Then that's like, oh, well, that's a red flag to me that he's suffering on this on some of his breaking qualities for whatever reason. The shape for those new people new to force plates would be like that's that next level that they would dive into. Um, the metrics help identify, you know, and, and not an issue, but just help you identify something that might need to be changed or adjusted or fixed and like would you pretend i mean there's obviously like just the context the context of the actual sport but could you potentially see that carry over into certain qualities on the field or court or whatever sport they play in yeah so like i think i mean that's the next frontier for a lot of this stuff because there, there's like so so much technology out there now so many different companies um like ams athlete management systems are trying to like you know merge that gap so you know, we, we send our force plate data to Smarter Base, like Coach Me Plus, Rock Daisy, all the AMSs. So they take in our data. Um, the user that's using that AMS is also taking in data from, you know, let's say like change of direction tests or sprint test. So like they're getting both pieces of the puzzle. Um, but right now it's still kind of up to the user that's using both of those to be able to create an AMS that says, hey, if they're improving and jump momentum on the plates, you know, they're actually getting quicker. And like, we're putting that data together in the AMS and like, it says, it says it's true. Now the next level, I don't know how far we are away from this. Like P 
people have been trying to do this for a long time and maybe some people really have, but it's going from, all right, we have a standardized assessment here. We can do this in the weight room every single day on all of our athletes. And we, we have data that says that make this metric improves in the weight room, they get faster. But then the next level is like, all right, how are they getting better at their, are they getting their ability for them to be faster? Did they have more receiving yards, you know, that year? So it's hard to answer that question and it takes a good team to answer that question. Um, it probably is being answered, but it's probably not being publicly shared by, you know, some pro teams or college teams even. Um, but that that's the goal. Like we're a part of that process. We're not claiming to be the entire process by any means at all. And I guess it helps to have different experts in different areas to help kind of put the pieces together. And you guys are more on the like data metric side. Of yeah. Per performance, performance uh, testing. Like I think in order to make that picture happen really well, like you, you really need like some people with legit data science skills, um, computer science skills that understand the sport. Um, those people are probably building, like there are teams now in, in the pro setting that are just building their own athlete management system. You know, like it's, we'll just hire a developer, we'll build it, we'll hire data scientists, and we'll take in all the perform all the, the sport data and we'll pair with the performance data, we'll use machine learning to make better decisions, draft better players. Like it's still very new. Some teams have been doing it for a couple of years. Uh, but that's a lot, like, it's still a process. Like you always have to refine it and make it better. You learn new stuff every day. Um, that's like, that's big data stuff. And, and there's people that get degrees and just, you know, stuff like that. Um, whereas we're, we are doing really cool stuff on the performance side, like allowing people, because if you don't have this data to begin with and you can't plug it into your system and you can't answer that, we're helping people get this routinely, quickly, as efficient as possible. And how does this play into like a return to play process? Yeah. So think uh, most simple form, like we're just uh, measuring a, a change on the plate. So like in a perfect world, you have baseline data on someone before they get injured. So then as soon as they go through the return to play process, the plates can be a part of that. Like you can do uh, body weight squats. You can do like we have a tagging system. Like you can do any sort of exercise on these plates that you want. Um, you just tag at that exercise and do it. You can stand on the plates. You can see if an athlete is weight shifting to their left side or their right side, just standing there, you know, immediately post post surgery. So they can be used as a tool. Um, but then once you get the athlete to a point, say they can jump again, um, your set point is when they were healthy. So you just, you jump them when they're able to jump. And let's say it's like 70% of where they're at when they were healthy. You can say, oh, like you're not there yet. You're not back. Like historically, that was the measure. But so now we can say, hey, you're at 70% of where you were at. You're also still not really using your left leg. That was the ACL that you tore. And you're taking, you know, 20 milliseconds longer to produce that jump. Um, your counter movement depth down. You know, you're not moving it through that left limb as much as you would, limited range of motion. Um, and then when you land, you actually land stiffer on your left leg because you're afraid to get into a range of motion when you land. So higher force when you land. So we can answer those questions now in that return to play process. Rufus, I know you have any questions on that. No, go ahead. Keep going. Well, I was going to ask a question that you're probably going to want to ask too. So I think it works out. Okay. Uh, so in terms of that return to play process, I know there's not like we can predict injuries, but are there like metrics that can, that you guys see pop up where it's like, we need to get this better than their initial pre-injury numbers to decrease the chances that something like this will happen again? Yeah. So I always ask the question of, all right, so let's say we have this baseline data. Were they, were they deficient in breaking that impulse compared to their peers before they got injured? Yes or no. Then they got injured. Then you're like, oh, maybe it was because of the low breaking that impulse or low breaking that impulse and low breaking RFD. So they don't really have the capacity as their peers and they're not doing it as quickly said they got injured throughout the season. When we're returning them to play, we want our output and our strategies to come back first. But then we also have to ask in that process, like, are they still at a risk of injury because their drivers are way down? Like, do they just not have the ability to decelerate? So yeah, um, you know, drivers are important in that process as well. Thing you wanna add, so, Rufus? Um, so can you, 
I mean, not predict an injury, but can you tell when somebody may be more susceptible to a non-contact injury than others based on your data? You can def like, I'm not going to say you can definitely, but like you can look at, I can look at a, someone's jump and say, Hey, you know, I'm not saying this person's going to get injured or it's a prediction, but I would right. say that they're more at risk than probably someone else. Um, because if we think of, of breaking as deceleration, like if you can't decelerate in this, this task that we're asking you to do, that is super controlled, you know, in the weight room, we warmed you up perfectly. Everything's in your favor. If you can't do it, then, then what happens when you go out to the field, you have to react to a player, the ball, and you go to cut and you can't really, you don't have, um, the ability to decelerate in that position, then you get into a weird position and that's when, you know, things can tear. Right. Um, or also like a, like an unpredictable uh, situation. So like, let's use like a, an outfielder in baseball. So say they're, let's say we've identified some outfielders having, and I, I'm always using breaking that impulse. Like you can, there's other things within this equation, but let's say breaking that impulse is really low. Um, and they're running, running towards, they're chasing a ball towards the outfield wall. And they turn at the last second. They see that the wall is there. They have an extreme amount of momentum going towards that wall, low breaking that impulse. And they, they try to stop themselves. Don't really have the ability to stop themselves, especially at a, a super high speed. Because, you know, if you saw that wall and you were anticipating it, you probably wouldn't be running that fast. So they're running super fast not aware of the walls there, see it, plant, don't have the ability to stop themselves in that weird situation. And that's when things happen in, in sports as well. Okay. So, so there is, um, so you kind of, you can kind of, is this right? You can kind of say that, okay, this guy may be susceptible to this type of injury because of this. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Now, now there is a, there is companies out there that will say, you know, we can oh, predict injuries. Yeah. We, we yeah. don't feel comfortable as a company saying that because um, yeah, we, we think there's so much that goes into an injury. Um, but, you know, I can look at a group of athletes and say, Hey coach, like, I think I would, I would look at these athletes and spend a little more time with them trying to address this problem. Um, right. You know, it's easy for me to look back on it and say, ha, that athlete got injured. But like, yeah. I don't want, I, no one wants any athletes to get injured and I don't want to be able to prove that those athletes got injured. So um, there, there's metrics that could say, hey, you, you don't move as efficiently as possible and you don't really have the gas to decelerate or the gas to push off the plates. So let's right. build that up. Okay, cool. Corey, go ahead. To, yeah, can we, cause I know you mentioned like the area under the curve before and impulse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you just explain that in a little bit more detail and then maybe even relate it back to like how that would like that player on the wall, like he sticks his foot out and can't decelerate or like hit that breaking impulse. Yeah. So uh, people talk about like impulse on social media all the time and impulse is an equation is force times time. So someone has to apply a force over a period of time in order to produce momentum and move. So like when we walk, every single time we're walking, we're producing impulse, like an impulse to move us from, you know, off of this chair over to the door and walk out and get a coffee, like produce an impulse, produce an impulse moving around here. So it's literally just force and time. It's an area. Um, this is not correct, like in physics or biomechanics or anything, but I, I would think of it as like a body of work within each phase. So it's work is an actual term in physics. So I try not to use it a lot, but it makes sense. It's just, you know, how much work are you doing in the unweighting phase? How much work do you do in braking and propulsion? So it could be synonymous with how much area do you have in those spaces um, or how much impulse do you have in those spaces? So it's just how now like, and so within sport, and this is talked about you Google impulse and sport, it'll talk about this, like time constraints. So some sports, you have to produce force quicker. Like you need to be able to cut quicker, change the direction quicker. Um, you see a receiver, you might need to come off that line quicker. So sometimes it's not 
producing the most force is producing enough force within that time constraint to be better than your the people you're going against so impulse like let's say we're looking at breaking that impulse you can have two two like two impulse breaking that impulses that are the same value but achieve differently like one could have a higher force shorter time and then the other one could have a longer force right oh yeah so uh taller force shorter time or longer time lower force so like big mountain midwest hill um but they could equal the same value so and i think it's that's why it's important to look at the shape of it in addition to the metrics because you could some two athletes could have the same value but produce it differently so it could be someone who's like quick and springy who can produce a lot of force over that short period of time versus someone who might be a little bit bigger, a little bit stronger, who can produce, get to the same amount of force. It just takes them a, a longer period. Yeah. Compare. Like the, the best analogy is like, it's like there's video servicing of like bodybuilders doing box jumps, like insanely tall box jumps, like Jack dudes. And they like load up and they basically stop at the bottom and they just do a squat jump to do this insanely high box but they're just using like all of that muscle, all of that force. Is it efficient? No, because they're basically just doing a squat jump. Whereas like you may have like this really skinny guy, doesn't look like he has a lot of muscle, but he can really use, you know, this unloading and loading to his advantage and transferring that momentum. And he might do the same, the same box, but it's going to look entirely different. And so if someone's lacking in that breaking net impulse, if they run into a scenario in their sport where they can't produce that force in the time constraint, like that could be a potential area where an injury may occur just their tissues are not going to be able to handle whatever the demand is that's imposed. Yeah. Cause that, that's what, that's what injuries are. Like if you get in a position and your tissue can't, you can't handle it. So, you know, we can just, we're a diagnostic tool. We can identify that, Hey, maybe your, your tissues aren't in a spot like within this phase to handle the load that's being asked. And we're only asking it to handle like your, your weight and gravity and going against it. We're not asking you to, you know, run and then handle it or react and handle it or football, throw someone on your back and handle it. So that's the overlap. Can you give an example of this, of someone who like, you look at their counter movement jump or just watch them jump and they like absolutely crush the propulsive phase, but like the other phases don't look as good. Yeah. Um, so there, there are athletes, they're like pro athletes that you would watch them play and be like, that's an explosive athlete. Um, but I've seen some of those athletes have like very low breaking rate of force development. So like they're, they're, they're quick and really shallow with their jump. Like they're the athlete stands on the place and you're just like, Phew. but then like they use all propulsion to get off the plate. So it's like, yeah, this athlete propulsive net impulse, super high jumps really high peak power, super high, super on when he plays the sport explosive runs past everybody. Great. Eight years from now tears his ACL because he never really had the qualities like he got away with it for a long time but it caught up to him at some point so it's like this continuum of okay you can be really good for eight years and then not and then be done or like you can address this from the beginning and play for you know eight, 16 years play play a lot longer so we're just pr providing that tool to diagnose it sooner so would that be like a basketball player typically pro basketball player uh situation i was talking about was basketball but it could be yeah, you know it could yeah. be any sport it could be i'm just using that as an example yeah yeah i guess yeah yeah like is, are you guys like is one of your like something you're tracking like trying to get to a point of like hey like if you're below this like these numbers or these metrics like this is like kind of a red flag of like we really need to work on this because it's really going to increase the chance for injury um there needs to i mean we have, there's a lot of, we have a lot of data because we, we have a lot of users at this point um, throughout the world, but we've, we've taken the approach as a company, like we don't own your data because like we, we want to value the privacy of the organization. Um, there's a lot of data at hand. So like people could use, could do machine learning and blah, blah, blah with it. But I don't know, it's a, it's a tall task. There's people that are trying to solve it. Um, not to say that we wouldn't try to solve it either. Um, but can't really talk a lot about that, but it could be done definitely. Like it could be, it could never be done and say like one for 100% certainty, but it, it can be, mm -hmm. it can get closer. 
Anything you want to add, Rufus? Nope. No. Nope. You? Not yet. Nice. Uh, uh, probably, probably have like uh, 15 more minutes. Okay. Um, My Apple Watch is telling me to stand up. <laughs> yeah, well, stand up then. <laughs> hey, this is nothing fancy, man. We do, we we do you know drink, we do whatever we want. So man, we're doing this at the wrong time. Um, uh, I got. I'm looking at this at this PowerPoint you got on here, um, and I'm looking at the the right and left leg on the unwaiting phase, mm -hmm. and so it's it's telling me that he's not unweighting very much on the right leg as much as on the left leg. Is that correct? Um, trying to look at the key. I have, I have different colors on here. Um, oh. A blue and white is the, uh, as the, uh, yeah, the right is the left. white. Um, yeah. So yes, he is actually, so th the white is above the blue. So he's putting more force through his right side um, than his left. But like, the range of motion so the motion that he's moving with is about the same but he actually this athlete is favoring uh the right side a little more just by standing there on the plates do you see how that that separation at, at the start yeah yeah okay. so like you would i mean in theory you'd want that to be right right over the top of each other right hmm huh. that's interesting i didn't think about that so then is he is in that unweighting phase, he's unweighting more on his left than his right. Is that how that's right? Uh, it, it perceives as that, um, but it actually, like he started from that position. So like, if we look at the change, it probably is pretty similar. Yeah, I get, yeah, um, he yeah, just always started. He just started at that point. Yeah, um, I, I get but I see yeah, just him, him starting at that point would be like, that would be something that I would, I would value. Um, let's, um, uh, Corey's a big baseball guy. Um, let's talk about that, that Ash Ashworth. Is that how you say it? Ashworth test? Ash test. Uh, the guy's name Ash is Ben Ashworth that developed yeah. it. Yeah. To, uh, explain to um, um, uh, uh, Corey I about it. I tried to explain it and I can't, I can't do it. So um, we have a blog. I'll, I'll pull it up real quick as we're talking through it, but it's an upper body assessment on the plate. So these plates can be used not just for lower body, but also upper body. Um, I mean, the plates can really be used for like for anything. As long as you have like a process of zeroing them and standardizing what you're doing, you can set it up and use them however you want. Um, like wow. we've mounted, we've mounted force plates on a wall before, you know, if you, if you set it up the right way. So uh, the ash test, and if you're looking at the screen, you can use one plate or two plates, <clears throat> sorry, but you lay it out in front. Um, there's three positions historically it would be the I position. So it's an outstretched arm um, overhead and then a Y position, which is 135 out degrees out to the side. Mm -hmm. um, and then we actually have a T would be that third position. Yeah. Um, this, this picture that we're looking at is a calling it like a, a reverse eye, I, I think. Um, basically just be zero down at the side this zero position is kind of a newer one and, and this guy that wrote this article for us was aaron trunt he's at uh sanford in either north or south dakota um he's a young researcher i really enjoy talking to him about plates he works with a lot of golfers and, and baseball pitchers so they've been using this test in addition to those three previous um but you know the main metric based on the research like you can look at all the metrics that we produce in our test here for this test, but the research uh, talks about peak force, like at those angles. So think of it as like uh, dynamometry. You use that in PT now, I'm sure. So we, we can extend the arm in, in different positions, push as hard as you can into the center of the plate. Um, you want to keep your opposite arm behind your back and you want to keep the athlete flat. Like you don't want them to like go on the side and using all their body weight into it. But you just measure it at those angles, measure left and right. Is there any discrepancies between the left and the right side? Um, I believe it's 10% body weight at all angles would be, is, is a picture of all the angles. Uh, but 10% body weight is the goal. 
Let me pull that up. Yeah, I think so. 10% of your body weight is the peak force that you want to hit. I think we took it out because we didn't want to exactly say 10, but that that's the standard that I use um, with my pitchers. That I mean, I help at, at Colby College too. I didn't preference that, but that's what I, I use for my pitchers. Is I want them to be a 10% at each position. It says to not use weighted balls unless they hit that 10% body weight peak force. Yeah, this would be uh, so. This would be like an example guideline. It's not saying this is what you should use. Um, more so, like you take the information that you've collected, and this would be now an action plan that you hit, and then you test the ash test, like routinely when they can hit 10% body weight. All right, now let's upgrade and use heavier ball. You could say, all right, now we're ready for um, different types of squat loading once we hit, you know, a certain jump. Like it could be, it's just a progression by using the weighted balls. So would this be something where you can, like you're monitoring like for fatigue more like on a weekly or like daily basis? No, not as much fatigue. So when you're monitoring fatigue, readiness, monitoring kind of all the same bucket, you want to use assessments that have uh, stress shortening cycle involvement. So, you know, you're using your stress shortening cycle here, but like you're kind of getting set up static. Okay, push down only. So like you could think of like these, isometric this isometric test um it's really just propulsion like you're just pushing down you're not loading and then pushing um so it's not as sensitive for readiness as something that involves like rapid stretch shortening cycles so like go back to the lower body like uh counter movement jump drop jump multi-rebound pogo stuff like that is better than like an isometric test for readiness based on the literature now i believe in and this is something that would be cool for people to look at and i, I believe uh paul comfort is, he's a big isometric researcher out of uh, the uk he might be doing some work in this space but basically like rapid pulls so like you're like pull as hard as you can for one second rest pull as hard as you can for one second rest pull as hard as you can for one second rest so like repetitive max effort pulls I don't know if there's like stuff in the research that says, hey, this would be used for readiness, but it kind of makes sense that it could be. Um, the same way like with this ash test, like you could, someone could try this, but you could uh, set up a IYT position. For pitcher, I would, so if, you, if you're if time constraint, I say select one or two of these positions. So let's say a baseball pitcher, uh, that motion tends to happen at a Y or a T. So like from that angle. So if you can only have time for two, do the Y and the T, don't do the I. If you only have time for one, do the Y. So you can test more if you only do the Y. But say you start, you know, in the off season, if you're you're listening to this and you're training baseball, you're not going to play until the spring. Um, so you could implement this right away. But think of just like continuous pushes. So like you could get them in that Y and say, set up a metronome, say push like on the beep, on the metronome and see at what level do they fatigue. Like, can they hit that peak force level that they did on the first one for 10 pushes? Or does it, you know, how long does it take them to get to a point where they can't hit that peak force level? Maybe it's 80% of it. Um, but you could think of that like starting pitcher. Like, you want those guys to be able to last the game if they have to. Like, you know, all seven innings, nine innings. So that test makes sense. Have I seen it done? No. But in, in theory, be a good study for someone to look at. And then how come they use uh, movements involving a stretch shortening cycle to measure readiness? So <clears throat> there's been some studies done. Um, I don't know like what exactly they tested, but um, essentially just says that like they ran a squat jump, ran isometric test, ran drop jump. And they said that it took longer for the athletes to return to their outputs within the drop jump. Whereas like the squat jump returned 24 hours before or the isometric return 24 hours sooner than the drop. Um, so I think it's like, it's either 48 to 72 hours is the time period it takes for short shortening cycle to fully like recover. So that's right, why yeah. if you're, if you're assessing the T you want to use something that like a drop, like a CMJ, a drop jump. There's even, there's even critics of the CMJ being used for readiness and we can get into that. And I, I feel passionate about that. Uh, they're like, oh, you can't, you can't really use that for readiness because it's a slow stretch shortening cycle movement. The drop jump would be better because it's much more faster, more demand. 
I agree with you. But also, if you get in an environment of Division One pro basketball players, football players, whatever, never jumped on a plate, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take you like a month before they really, truly get good at the skill of a drop jump. It's the same way like you try to teach them a front squat. It's going to take it's going to take a period of time before they get good at it and you start actually progressing with that movement. So, and you know, like college basketball, football, your time is a commodity. So like if I can go in from day one and just ask them to put their hands on the hips and jump as high as they can. And I feel confident about the readiness looking at the whole, the whole picture, not just jump height. Um, I'm going to use that movement and do it more consistently because the drop jump takes a little longer too. So, you know, if I can do counter movement jump, five days of the week, but I can only do the drop jump twice. Uh, to me, I'm getting a better picture if I can do it more frequently than just being perfect and doing it, you know, once a week, twice a week, once a month. Uh, that makes a lot of sense too, especially with that learning curve. Um, I know you mentioned a little bit earlier of just like, especially if you're new to force plates, just not necessarily going off the curve as much initially till you get the like metrics down. Do you have any other advice for people who are either new to force plates or looking to get more into force plates, like just where to start? Yeah, um, we and uh, just kind of how to get yourself acclimated. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the best way is to get your hands on them and, and see it yourself and just honestly start testing yourself. So if you are a coach or young coach intern, anyone that can be at a place that has plates, like test yourself, see where you're at, develop a hypothesis try to change yourself like try to influence that i think that's the quickest way to learn um so that when you get in a position and you have to answer this question for you know 10 athletes you're responsible for 20 40 you've kind of been through you've been through it with yourself so you under you can try to make a better decision um so that's step one but then like education resources like we put out a lot of free stuff um like if you we have a lot of stuff on youtube all the tests are on there videos our blog has a lot of information. Um, we speak at different events. We we have a performance team, so we're on podcasts and stuff. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I, I think our website's a great place to start. Uh, but then you can't be like actually getting your hands on it and doing it. How important is understanding just like what the actual physics terms mean and how they apply? Yeah, I think uh, I probably have taken this for granted a little bit. I think I think it is important, and I think that's actually an area that a lot of coaches nowadays don't really have a great grasp on. Um, I started out – like, my, my school was pretty, like, rigor, rigorous academically, my college that I was at. So um, I started out on the PT track, just like I'm sure a lot of coaches do. Like, you don't really know what you want to do. PT sounds cool. Um, so, like, I've, I've taken, like – four physics courses and then my master's there was more physics and biomechanics involved and then i went and worked for max schmarzo which knows everything about <laughs> physics and the human body so like i think it's it's super important um at least to have an understanding of it you don't need to know like there's there's like just like chapters within each physics course that i i took like if i would just take those chapters and make them apply to this type of movement like that would probably be enough for a lot of, of coaches um there's a couple of textbooks that i would recommend um what is it i think it's biomechanics of strength and conditioning or biomechanical analysis of strength and conditioning i think it's by gavin moore i believe that's his his name or the author's title um that was a really good book for helping understand it in an applied way. Um, and then also, uh, I think Dan Cleaver, he has a book called force. It's pretty good. Um, if you really don't, you know, don't really have any understanding of physics at all, it's a good place to start. And then honestly, Max, Max's blog, uh, strong by science.net. Like he does not, he doesn't really write on it anymore. The last article is probably from like 2017, but talks a lot about physics. If you just get back into that. I like it. Yeah, because it seems like if you don't necessarily understand the physics, you're going to have a hard time, like, understanding what's going on, how it's applying to what you're actually seeing. Yeah, and it's it's the same way with, like, you should have a you should have an understanding of physics if you want to be, like, a, you know, high-level coach or trainer or PT. Like, it's kind of, a, it should be a prerequisite. I think it's, it's probably getting lost by the wayside nowadays, but I, I do think it's important. 
Cool. No. Right, Rufus? Okay. Um, well, Derek, thanks very much. I know you got to go, and we want to keep hold that to you so we can have you back. <laughs> but um, Coming back. Part two. Um, yeah, that'd be awesome. I also want to do a part three. Um, <laughs> um, a film tell us. Movie. Uh, tell, put it on tell, Netflix. Uh-huh. Yeah, we can do it. Nah, put, put it on Netflix. <laughs> Uh, we'll do something else. I, I don't like Netflix. Um, Amazon Prime. Yeah, I, I, I don't even know what that is. So, <laughs> um, uh, I barely know what Netflix does. Um, tell us uh, where we can get a hold of you, where people can get a hold of you, if if they want to contact you, and you know your websites. I know you got an Instagram, and it's really good. And and uh, uh, just, um, just get all that out. Yeah, so strength to speed on strength two dot speed on Instagram is my handle. Um, probably most responsive on there, unless it's like a force plate. Like if you want force plates, if you have a, a specific question, you can email me at drake at hawkindynamics dot com. Um, responsive there as well. You know, I have Twitter and and all the other stuff, but those are probably the two best. And uh, um, I know Hawkin has a YouTube channel. It's got some really good videos. I think you did them over COVID. Was that right? Did a lot of them over COVID. Yeah, um, yeah. And it's got some really good um, um, uh, uh, information on them where they did Zoom calls with different guys. And I think it's, is it Hawking Dynamics? Is that the YouTube channel? Yeah, just Hawking Dynamics. Yeah. And yeah, yeah, we have a we have like a full research team. So um, Dr. Jason Lakes, our director of education, yeah. Like if you read like a lot of the work on like early work on like power and just biomechanics, and that's another great resource talking about physics, like all of Dr. Jason Lake's papers, great resources if you're trying to understand this stuff better. Um, but he has webinars and stuff on our YouTube that you could check out. Um, and then Peter Mundy, Dr. Peter Mundy, um, he just joined our team well as science officer. So, you know, if you can just find our content on YouTube or blog, uh, put out some stuff to help our our users and people interested the uh, uh also the the blog on uh on on your website is really awesome too it's got some really good articles and it's got and then it's got leads to other art or uh, links to other articles you know what they're talking about it's really it's really cool i just i go through it just get inundated with it and, and uh, I, I haven't read all of them but i'm getting through them so. <laughs> we'll add some more when you're finished <laughs> You have to let me know when you're getting close. Yeah, I, I will. Um, but yeah, it's and and you know, I got, like I said, they um, Hawkins has been really good to me and uh, uh, you know, answer my questions and you know, Drake even took me to dinner one time so and answered all my questions while we ate Greek food. Good so, dinner. Yeah, I think that was the first Greek restaurant I've been to, so I appreciate really? you taking me there. Yeah. Really? Well, next time you come, I'll take you. I'll take you back there. So. We're, so we're searching some other ones. We found a new one the other day. So we got to so, get Corey there back in Indianapolis. So Corey, Corey likes there. that Greek food too. You know, he, he, uh, well, the good place you went to closed, you said. Yeah. My favorite place closed. I was telling him that. So, but, uh, uh thanks for your time, uh, Drake. I really appreciate it. And, uh, we'll, we'll be back in touch. We'll talk some more. Okay. Cool. See you guys next thanks, time. Thanks, buddy. Take care. Yeah, thanks for coming hey, on. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. Nice meeting you, Corey. Bye bye. See you guys.